All right, so I'm going to try the stool one more week, and I'll tell you like I told the kids. I'll sit on this one more week, and then we'll see what it's like. Maybe I'll stand up next week. I don't know. I may get used to this. <laughs> may get me a comfy chair up here. All right. Somebody says no, because we'll be here all day then. So, well, yeah, I could, I could do that too. You know, I, I know, I know, I'm, I'm built low. There's, there's. I knew what you meant. Let's pray. God, you have heard our voices lifted up in song and praise. You have uh, received prayers uh, spoken out loud and those silent prayers that we have offered up. God, you have spoken to us in the words of Scripture as they were read. And now, God, I ask that you will um, allow your servant to speak words that you inspire, that you will allow your people to hear words, not of my choosing, but your words. And may they transform and may they grow. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the church, or more specifically, the, the people of the church, you and, and I, uh, if you haven't figured it out by now, are a uh, crazy dangerous bunch. Uh, you are crazy and dangerous. <laughs> we are crazy and, and, and dangerous. And I, don't, I don't mean that as a slam. Hear me out. If, 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 you're, if you spend as much time uh, in church as some of us spend in church, and, and some of us are pretty regular here, you're going to um, you're going to you're going to hear some things. And you're going to start believing some things that uh, you wouldn't let anybody out there put across you in everyday kinds of conversations. People. People swallow, people in church swallow things in sermons, for instance, that they, that they would never accept from folks they talk to out on the street in everyday conversations. Things like people living three or four or even 900 plus years, uh, as it's told in the Bible. People uh, even, ha uh, even into their 100s having children for crying out loud. People uh, will, will, uh, people will, will say things in church, and we believe them in talking about things like bushes that catch on fire but never burn up, or, or, or two of every single kind of animal there is all together on one big boat. We believe things, we believe stories about, about when, 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 when some men get, get thrown into a furnace or into lion's pits and they survive. We, we believe stories about talking donkeys. We believe stories about virgin births. We believe stories about people who've been dead for days coming back to life. Hmm. Even Paul, the apostle Paul, said that, when, that what we preach, when we gather together in places like this, what we preach is scandalous and foolishness to folk who don't gather up in places like this with us. If you're not sure, if you think I'm making it up, look in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, see what Paul says. 
And about all of this kind of craziness, there was a, there was a Danish uh, theologian. His, his name uh, was uh, Soren Kierkegaard. And, and, and Kierkegaard says, says this, Christianity has taken a giant stride into absurdity. He goes on to say, remove, remove from Christianity its ability to shock, and it is altogether destroyed. It becomes a tiny, superficial thing, capable neither of inflicting deep wounds nor healing them. And, that, and that's what happens when we, when we gather here in places like this, either, whether, it's, whether it's this house of worship or, or others perhaps that, that you have uh, had the opportunity uh, to, to be, uh, we, we, we gather together and sometimes, sometimes uh, words are spoken that heal and comfort, right? And, and, then, and then there are those times when, when, when some words are spoken uh, that, that shock and inflict wounds, we call that having our toes stepped on. But still, we keep coming. We, we keep coming back. We keep gathering together. And, and it's not long because we keep coming back for all of this. It's not long before uh, we convince ourselves that somehow all of this, all these crazy words began to make sense to us. And it's at that point when these words begin uh, to make sense, when we convince ourselves that these words are beginning to make sense, that we really start worrying folk that are out there that aren't in here with us. Love your enemies. That's a hard one for folk, right? Pray for those who persecute you. Here's one. Sell everything you have. Sell everything you have and give it away to the poor without expecting anything back from them, without requiring anything from them in return. And, and, we, and we talk about things like this when we, when we gather up in places like this, and it all sounds good to us when we're listening to these words with our Sunday morning ears. But the implications of hearing words like this with our Monday through Saturday ears is different. And, 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 and beyond hearing these words with our Monday through Saturday ears, then, then trying to live this way, trying to, trying to uh, live into all that we say, well, well, all of a sudden, these words are not just crazy. They're dangerous. They're dangerous. And it's especially true when we consider the words that we read out of Matthew's gospel in the fifth chapter this morning. The Beatitudes is what we call them. And the Beatitudes, Luke writes about them, Matthew writes about them, the way Matthew records them, uh, as, as I read this morning, happy are those, or, or more traditionally, it, it, it's, it's blessed are those, right? You've heard them before. Blessed are, are those, blessed are the people who are poor, who are mourning, who are meek. Blessed are people who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, who are merciful, who make peace, who are persecuted and reviled and slandered. Blessed are those people. Now, I'm not going to speak for you, but these are not the blessings that most people want, right? 
If we're honest with ourselves, being poor and being mournful and being hungry and thirsty and being persecuted and slandered and reviled are all experiences that we try to We would, we would rather be rich than be poor. We would, we would rather be elated than to be great. We, we, would, we would rather be self-assured than to be meek or humble. We would rather be those things because we know what happens to those folks who are like that, right? Meekness, meekness is fine when we're talking about it in the church, but try being meek tomorrow when you're at work. You want, you want meekness uh, at work will get you? It'll get you sent home with a pat on the back. And if you keep it up, it'll probably get you sent home with a pink slip. Blessed are the peacemakers. They get done to them what they wouldn't do to anybody else. Blessed are the merciful. They get it done to them again. Blessed are, blessed are those persecuted for the sake of righteousness. You know what happens to them? They get called names. They get called lunatics or fanatics. They, the people say that, that those folks are out of touch with reality. They, they, get, they get called names like, like uh, the, oh, that, that, those folks are woke, bleeding hearts. Personally, just speaking for me, I'd just rather be right than righteous. If these are blessings, then I'm not so sure that I really want any part of that. Unless, unless we misunderstand what it means to be blessed. What if blessed does not mean what we think it means? Blessed is, 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 one of those, is one of those words that fall into a category of language that I call church ease. Church ease is that kind of language that we speak when we gather up in places like this and we use words in church that we rarely use out in the world. And it, we, we use words that, in, in church that we, that we sometimes think we all understand. We all understand what we're talking about, but nobody can really clearly, accurately, succinctly define that word. You know what some, some church ease words are? Anointed, right? Righteous. Blessed falls in that category of words of which that we use in the church like that. Ask something, and you're very likely to hear them reply, oh, I'm, I'm blessed. Tell somebody in, in the church uh, uh, to, as you're departing, you, you're often hear somebody say, well, have a blessed day. Or when they're, when they're leaving, we'll, we'll, we, we're very often uh, say, blessings to you, or, or be blessed. Someone asks about your, your situation in life, and, and very often folk in church will say, well, I've been blessed. I've been blessed with health. I've been, I've been blessed with a good job. I've, I've been blessed with, with, with skills and, and, and abilities. I, I've, been, I've, been blessed. I've been blessed with great kids. That's code word, by the way, for kids that don't embarrass you in public. And from statements like these, 
it, 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 it's, it's very easy to, to assume that blessed, the word blessed, can mean anything from, from being very lucky to just being happy. And oftentimes, Matthew's Beatitudes have been presented uh, as this list of a uh, very pious sounding platitudes about having the right kind of attitude that will result in good fortune and luck which will lead to a life of happiness and contentment. But I'm not sure that's what Jesus is talking about. In fact, I'm pretty sure that Jesus isn't saying that the poor, whether they're poor in spirit or just plain poor, I'm pretty sure Jesus is not saying that the poor are fortunate. I'm almost certain that Jesus is not saying that folks who are mourning, who are brokenhearted, who are dejected, are lucky. I'm absolutely convinced that Jesus is not saying that people who have been persecuted and reviled and slandered are happy. I think maybe a better way of, of, of understanding uh, what Jesus is saying, I think maybe a better word uh, for us to, to be able to get our minds wrapped around what he's, what he's talking about is, is the word honored. Honored has a very different connotation, very different meaning from good fortune or good luck or happiness. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus is very often depicted as teacher. Right, go, go back and read Matthew. Teacher is how it's referred to many times. And in our passage today, Jesus has, has gone up on the side of the mountain. Uh, his disciples have, have followed him up there. And, and he, he begins to teach them a new way of living and being. And this lesson, this lesson today will kind of set the stage for everything else that follows in Matthew's gospel. It, it, it lays the groundwork, if you will, of how we might understand Jesus' message uh, in, and, and his priorities. And the very first thing, the very first thing that Jesus teaches uh, his disciples is how to recognize blessedness. Or, or more specifically, how to recognize those things that God honors and those people that God honors. And I think this is very interesting. There, there, is, there is nothing in what Jesus says about how to become blessed. There's nothing in, in what Jesus says about how to earn God's honor and acceptance and love. Not even, not even anything about how to bless or honor each other. Rather, Jesus is teaching about how to recognize, how to recognize who has already been honored by God, who has already been blessed by God. And, and the important thing in all of this is that the folks that God honors are not necessarily folk that we think it should be or could be. Every single community, I don't care where in the world, every single community has its own definition, its own understanding of what it constitutes to be blessed, of what constitutes blessedness in the honored kind of sense. And we may not always use such a, a pious sounding word as blessed. Oftentimes we prefer to use words or phrases like uh, the good life or, or being successful. 
But we all have these ideas of what it means uh, for folks to have made it. Right? And, and the folks that have made it, in our opinion, are usually not those who are poor, whether poor physically or poor in spirit. They're usually not those who are mourning and brokenhearted. They're usually not those who are meek or pure in heart or thirsting and hungering for righteousness and, and, and all the rest. That, that we talked about in the Beatitudes. In our world, when we think of people who are blessed, when we think of someone who is blessed, we most often think of someone who is wealthy or powerful or successful or beautiful or in some other way enviable. Blessing, at least according to the standards of the world, is most often of the material kind. But Jesus is trying to teach us how to see uh, uh, what God calls blessed. And, and those that God calls blessed are the very ones who are down and out. Those are the very ones that are distressed by their circumstances. Those are the very ones that are passionate about promoting justice and working for peace. Those are the very ones who have been persecuted for doing the right thing. And it's important for us to recognize that those uh, we don't often perceive as being important or valuable or enviable in any way are precisely, they're precisely those that God chooses to bless and to honor and to love. And, and God chooses that because God has always choosed, chosen that. Choose to that? I did take English in school. And, and if, if, we, if we let ourselves read uh, this passage out of Matthew in this way, it, it, it's, it's almost as if uh, Matthew's version of the Beatitudes uh, is, is very similar to uh, Mary's song in Luke's gospel, the Magnificat. Remember that? We read that not long ago. And, and, and in uh, that passage in Luke's gospel, Mary is singing about how God favors those in need. In Matthew's gospel here, Jesus is urging his disciples, those disciples then and those of us who call ourselves disciples now, to look around us, to, 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 to see those folk around us differently than culture does. Rather, rather than measuring people by their possessions, we're told to see their character We're invited to, 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 to uh, not just take pity on people for their losses. We're invited to come alongside them and enter into their struggle. Rather than, than, than judging folk by their failures, we are expected to forgive them. And, and to remind them that they are honored and loved by God. And that they are, and that they are born, that they are born for more, so much more than they have settled for. Because we know that we are loved and honored by God. And we have been born for so much more than we have settled for. Rather than despise people for their weakness, them, the truest of God meeting God's people, of because God is revealed most clearly to us, most consistently to us at our places of deepest need. What? what 
place where people recognize that God always appears where God is least expected to be. Amid people's brokenness, amidst their heartache and their pain, amidst their struggle. And God shows up in those least expected places in order to bless that which the world refuses to bless. God shows up at those places in order to love what the world calls unlovable. God shows up in those unexpected places to redeem that which the world does not believe is worth saving. And what would, what would it be like if, if we became people who when we leave this place, when we leave this building called church, that we leave with, with, with new eyes, able to see and perceive in the needs of people around us, our neighbors and, and, and acquaintances, that we see in them not a nuisance in their needs or even something to be pitied, but rather what we see in folks who are in need are the marks of blessedness which we are privileged to meet. What would that look like? I think if that happened, we would, we would all be more like the, the, the community of discipleship that Jesus founded, fashioned on God's grace uh, to be different from the world around us, to be, to be places, to be people of forgiveness and mercy and grace and goodness. And I think, I think if we did that, that we might discover that others would be attracted to join us, to, to join with us. Because, because some folk, not all, not all, because some folks will refuse to, to accept that or believe it. But some folks will recognize that true freedom comes from letting go. Some folks will recognize that, that real strength grows from, uh, grows, uh, from real vulnerability. Some folks will recognize that, that, that lasting safety only comes through trust and mutual regard. In this passage, Jesus tells us in his own way that God's kingdom is not someplace far away, but is found whenever and wherever we honor each other as God's children. That, we, that we, when we bear each other's burdens, when we, when we bind each other's wounds, and when we meet each other's needs. You see, to be, to be really human is to be inescapably fragile and vulnerable. And the surprising thing for us is, and maybe not for us because we're here all the time, we believe the stuff that we say in church, but the surprising thing for folk out there that hardly ever come in here, the, the message we need to share with them is, is that, that the surprising character of God is not to reject any of these characteristics that we might call flaws or weaknesses or burdens or failures. Is the surprising characteristic of God is, is that God will gather all of them and all of us together in a divine embrace. like an onion in food. <laughs> Look, this, this is not necessarily an easy word to preach. Probably not an easy word to hear or accept. I get that. But ultimately, it is a true word. And it has the capacity to transform, to create and grant new life. Not because I'm speaking these words, but because God speaks these words. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek and the pure in heart and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and who are persecuted uh, on Christ's behalf. Folks, that is quite a list. And blessed also are those who see the blessings of God in their neighbor's need. Who see the blessings of God in their neighbor's need and give thanks that they have the capacity, that they are privileged, that they are invited to meet those needs. Blessed are those. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.